All right. That's your warm up. Good. Okay. So again, what we're seeing is it is again an effort to return power to the states. Bless you. It is um, different in that we're removing the federal government as an intermediary. Uh, we feel that states are, are as capable, if not more capable, along with the um, other entities out there that can help solve problems. Um, and again, really what you see a distinction here is it's philosophically based. The government that governs the least governs the best. That's part of Reagan's in this conservative revolution's philosophy. Okay? Um, what Reagan bumps into as he comes into office, though, is this kind of purple, you know, rainbow unicorn. Let's make it even more rare. Um, you've got something called stagflation. Um, it's kind of a combination of stagnation with inflation. That's where the word comes from, stagflation. And it is like, uh, uh, you know, it's sunny and snowing out at the same time. You have two things happening where you've got high inflation and high unemployment. And those two usually don't correspond. When you have high unemployment, people are out of work, right? Um, how do they feel about cash and spending? They're probably more reluctant to part with cash. So consequently, um, you tend to see kind of the value of if you've got a scarcity of cash, if people are holding on to cash, um, you tend to see its value increase. And yet what I've got here is inflation. Um, I've got the value of the dollar. You know, people are not valuing the dollar as much. The dollar is buying you less. Um, so this is, this is a difficult thing to kind of contend with. Um, Reagan's approach coming in is going to be, you know, I've got a, a, all these threes, right? I've got three um, things to remember with the New Deal. I've got three things to remember with the Great Society. Here with Reagan, what I've got is deregulation, tax cuts, and program cuts. Um, and we want exemplars of each. So you want to hold on to those. You want exemplars of each. The idea behind, you know, trying to manage this economy this way is coming from, and we've been over this before, supply-side economics. You know, his economic philosophy is the way to combat uh, unemployment and get the economy going again, the way to combat uh, inflation, he'll use a little bit more monetary policy, um, you know, is, is through this supply-side economics. The idea, again, is to do some business-friendly reforms, you know, mainly in the form of deregulation, uh, mainly in the form of tax cuts, uh, skewed towards uh, businesses and the wealthy. Uh, if we do these things, we'll make it easier for businesses to operate and to grow and to expand, and they'll be able to hire, and if they hire, people will begin to have money in their pockets, and we'll prime the economic pump that way. Um, people, again, and I previewed this, uh, previewed this, have derisively called supply-side economics, well, not derisively, they call it Reaganomics, just like they call uh, the healthcare reform Obamacare. Um, it does pin it on a particular president, so if you don't like it and you call it Obamacare, uh, it's kind of saying it's his fault. So this is a way, I suppose, of pinning um, this on Reagan if you don't like this approach. More derisively, they call it trickle-down economics. And I have a couple of um, political cartoons or other things that can kind of get you to, to see a little bit what we, you know, how people see it as derisive. Um, we'll see it in a second. Is tax cuts, when he comes in, um, taxes on the top 1% to 5% could be as high as 70%. Now, that's on earned income. Uh, that's on, you know, if they were drawing a salary from whatever their company is. Typically, the wealthy get more of their income from investments. And we tax that differently. We value work and investments differently. Uh, we feel like there's makers, uh, people that are wealthy, and they, they help make jobs. Um, they're, they're kind of creators. And therefore, we tax them differently to try to encourage that. But if you work, and remember, if you work, you're also a consumer, we're going to tax you differently. What's the tax rate for uh, you know, people that work? What comes out of a paycheck? What percent? It depends. Yeah, like when you're doing, when you're filing your income tax uh, at the end of the year. But if you're drawing a, a paycheck, right, what percent comes up? Like you're making 100 bucks and you think you're going to get 100 bucks. But what percent does the state and the federal government take out? It's a third. It's a third. A third of your paycheck. Um, so, again, you know, that's something for you guys to pay attention to as we go forward. Um, you know, what we see at the top 1% to 5% is they could be paying as high as 70%. Um, and, you know, the rate goes all the way down to 28%. And he's going he's gonna to level that out a little bit. 
what we'll see is that critics contend, what do the rich do with that money? Do they reinvest? Uh, it's the 80s. Um, the 80s is a fairly, I grew up in it, it's a fairly material uh, culture at this point. There's some superficiality to it. So the critics often charge that the wealthy kind of invested in luxury items, things that didn't exactly grow the economy. Um, <laughs> I don't know if they spent it all on jewels and furs and oil paintings and yachts and things like that, but that's the, that's the, the criticism. Some of the criticism is, too, that you've created all this business-friendly um, uh, you know, tax structure, but it's still cheaper for businesses to kind of take their businesses overseas, where labor is cheaper. And so what the tax cuts did is fund the exports of... Um, you know, American kind of businesses overseas, American capital and labor abroad. Um, so, again, just to kind of, I'm going to present two sides to kind of, you know, give you, this is the derisive version of trickle-down economics. That, you know, um, it's based on a, a theory that the poor who must subsist, live on, the table scraps dropped by the rich, can best be served by giving the rich bigger meals. You know, that's one way of looking at it. I talked about the stack. I've seen a lot of images where it's the wine glasses stacked on top of each other. And you pour into the top wine glass, you know, they're in a kind of a pyramid. And the idea is, is that top wine glass fills, it will fill the other glasses. That the top 1% to 5% are job makers. This essentially says they just make the goblet bigger and we just rely on the scraps. Give them a bigger meal, you get more scraps. And then you can, you can interpret that one. In contrast, you know, here's another quote in a political cartoon. Um, Paul Ryan, who is the, the current speaker of the House, talks about if you're, you're interested, um, if you're only interested in treating um, the symptoms of poverty and economic stagnation through economic redistribution and class warfare, you're not going to get anywhere because um, all you're doing is treating the symptoms. If you want to get to the root causes of poverty and economic stagnation, you need to promote pro-growth policies that promote prosperity. Um, there is this countervailing image of um, the idea that uh, the federal government, again, maybe it doesn't know the best. The government that governs the best governs the least. If you give the federal government more money, all it's going to do is spend, and it may be at the expense of one of your drivers of the economy. Okay, So that's the debate that's going on behind the, the, uh, the we're going to see deregulation, we're going to see tax cuts, we're going to see program cuts. And behind this is, yes, we want to get out of stagflation, but it's this philosophical argument going on about um, supply side versus demand side economics. And it's funny because it's up again in the election, isn't it? We're back to once again talking about supply side versus demand side. Um, where, you know, if you look at Trump's um, tax plan, it is you know, uh, in somewhat in the same mold as, you know, Reagan's plan, this idea of um, more business-friendly kind of policies and tax cuts, um, you know, that may benefit the, the higher income individuals. Hillary Clinton talks about, I'm going to fund um, the programs and the things I want to do by, and she's very open about it, by taxing that 1% to 5%. And we're going to try to grow middle out. So that argument back then is, is back again. And again, we'll look at deregulation, we'll look at tax cuts, we'll look at program cuts. And in each case, you just want to be able to hold on to some, um, you know, an ability to illustrate, uh, you know, policies or, or, or things that are help you illustrate what deregulation looks like. Um, you know, it's, um, I forget where in, in Massachusetts, but there's a, a sewer company that has been cited by OSHA 13 different times. I talked about OSHA, the Office of Safety and Health Administration. Um, two workers just died in essentially, uh, uh, they, were, they were working within a, a culvert or a kind of a ditch and the water levels rose and they were basically trapped underground and they, and they died. Um, you know, uh, the company initially might be complaining that, geez, OSHA's on me all the time. Their costs are driving up. Um, their regulation is driving up my cost to kind of show them I'm doing all these procedures and protocols to meet safety standards. Uh, but here we have two workers die. And that really is kind of two sides of the coin with, the, with regulation. Regulation is, you know, again, you've got either safety concerns or quality concerns, and um, you want oversight. Well, that oversight costs. And typically, we are not happy about the cost until somebody gets hurt. And then we understand, hey, cost makes sense. You know, for example, 
you know, regulation within schools costs money, and you may not care about it until you send your kids to school and you're concerned about quality education. Um, uh, regulation drives up transportation costs, and you may not care about it until you're about to step on a plane or you get on one of those buses that's going to take you to New York and you realize it's, you know, um, it's not licensed and, and, you know, the last uh, five buses have exploded on I-95. You know, we get concerned about regulation when um, something bad has happened. You know, we point out to the recent kind of meltdown on Wall Street uh, that put us into the most recent recession. And, you know, the, um, what we felt coming out of it was, well, Wall Street wasn't regulated enough. And that's why we had this kind of catastrophe. And now what you see a little bit is the pendulum trying to swing the other way where we've got to get these costly regulations off of businesses. So again, that's the kind of the two sides behind it. What you see during Reagan is, um, you know, working against price controls on oil and gasoline, um, trying to ease uh, restrictions put on by the, the governmental, the federal agency, the National Highway Tra Traffic and Safety Administration, where they were increasingly requiring cars to have certain safety features. Let's ease that. Let's ease requirements with regards to airbags and, and fuel efficiency. I mean, speed limit came about, a national speed limit came about because we had an oil crisis and a concern of um, better fuel efficiency and, and, you know, conserving oil that way and saving lives. And um, the idea here is, um, well, that's costly. Let's ease those things back. Um, I remember uh, cable was just kind of coming out as a, as a new thing. Um, and you know, the regular channels were highly regulated. Um, they had, like, for example, there was a... Um, uh, I'm trying to remember the name for it, but essentially it's an equal time rule, a fairness in broadcasting rule, where you had to give, uh, if you're covering an issue, you have to give equal time to both sides. And then along came, um, and then content was regulated too in terms of language and um, nudity and things like that. Uh, along comes the cable industry, and it's kind of like this separate bandwidth over here. And what they decided is let's not regulate it. And you know that is, in, in essence, what allowed for a lot of the cable network news uh, channels that began to more narrow cast on both ends of the spectrum. Um, that's what a lot of, allowed a lot of more of adult contact content on um, the cable networks that eventually kind of came into the regular networks. I can't picture a show that I'll watch with my son yet. There's not a single. I don't know if you guys watch with your parents, um, but there's like I can't think of a single show where I'm like, oh, you know, uh, th that's a conversation. Um, so it's it's kind of interesting the the, the long range impact on that. Um, airlines were deregulated. Um, I'll, I'll preview him in a second. James Watt was the Secretary of the Interior, and he was well before Sarah, Sarah Palin with the drill baby drill. I don't know if you were following politics a little while ago, but Sarah Palin was um, uh, John McCain's vice presidential running mate, and you know she's from Alaska, and she was kind of famous about saying, "Let's let's open up um, more places to drill domestically, including." Um, you know, in, in areas that are perhaps protected. And, and the simple way she said it was drill, baby, drill. Um, James Watt was all about, you know, that. Um, easing pollution controls. Uh, again, we had, a, again, history repeats itself. The um, Wall Street was allowed to get involved in what they called bundled securities. And they eventually became toxic securities. They were essentially speculating on the real estate market, but it was a bunch of mortgages and, and things kind of bundled together. And eventually when the housing bubble burst, it dragged down Wall Street and it dragged down the rest of us. Well, they back then there were these savings and loans institutes. Um, and they were uh, essentially allowed to go beyond just doing savings and loan. They were allowed to speculate in the real estate market. And again, you had a bubble burst. And again, you had to have a big governmental bailout. Um, in this case, costing, you know, uh, Hundreds of, of uh, institutions went down and billions of dollars were needed for the payout. So that's deregulation. And again, it's a, it's a pretty, um, this is what polarizes people, you know, on the political spectrum. Um, you know, there are the pro-business side that um, see these as good things. And then there are the, you know, if you were an environmentalist, you looked at James Watt as the boogeyman. Um, and you looked at what Reagan was doing as, um, taking away a lot of, um, you know, safety nets and securities here. So um, this was kind of a common, common image of, of James Watt. Um, tax cuts. I mentioned the, you know, the high rate here was at 70% for the top 1%. 
um, and it ran all the way down to, to 28%. So what you see is an across the board 25% cut, a bottom rate of 15%. I'd kill for that 15% today. Um, again, this is part of fiscal policy. The idea is um, to essentially cut the tax rate, put more money in, in people's pockets, especially um, you know the top 1% that are going to be the business makers um, in, the, in you know, the job growers. Uh, what we're going to do for inflation is use the Fed. We'll talk about them later. That is a um, – we manage our monetary policy through the um, – through the Fed, and there's a head of the Fed, and they set uh, interest rates. And, and the interest rates are, is the amount they're going to charge member banks to loan them money, and eventually that translates into the interest rate that you would be charged to borrow money. So if we set interest rates high, are you more likely to borrow money? You know, you're going to have to borrow for college, and I'm going to charge you 100% interest. Who's looking for work, right? Who's not going to college? If I say it's at 1% or 0.001% are you likely to borrow money, right? So I can use the interest rate to encourage or discourage borrowing and therefore encourage money to come into circulation or stay out of circulation. And the idea here was let's, let's tighten the money supply. Let's raise interest rates um, to increase the value of money. Prior to this, we were actually kind of doing the opposite. The idea was to, you know, go through the looking glass in some ways and, and uh, lower interest rates to the point where we could get more money into circulation and <coughs> use it more to kind of like get the economy going again um, and then hope that as the economy gets going again, money would straighten itself out. This is kind of the point where we begin to separate fiscal and monetary policy. We begin to realize that, you know, you can almost work at cross purposes with them. Now, here come the program cuts. Um, what you see here is you know, an effort to downsize the scale of government. Um, and Reagan comes in and, uh, d you know, cuts $39 billion from the federal budget, which represents about 5% of the budget. Um, it, it, on some level, uh, we're going to see in a second when we contrast to the kind of the buildup in defense spending, this has dramatic impact, but it doesn't dramatically impact the budget. That's what makes it so hard to do budget cuts. When you do a cut, you're taking away something that benefits someone. It has real consequences. It has uh, a real hurt to it. But in terms of like the overall scale and scope of the budget, you might not put a dent in it. So you've kind of inflicted real hurt without a massive amount of benefit. Um, what we see again is, is this 5% across the board budget cut, but where it's really concentrated is in social welfare programs. So again, Reagan is coming in and he's giving uh, an across-the-board tax cut, but it seems skewed to the wealthy. He's deregulating, and again, the concern is that seems skewed to the wealthy. And now I'm doing program cuts, and again, it seems skewed to the wealthy. Again, he is um, a figure that some people love as a conservative icon, and other people, especially in this time, um, it, it really polarized. They were they were um, feeling like he was, um, uh, you know doing all kinds of disservice to the lower class. What we see, for example, is AFDC um, and other welfare assistance for the working poor being cut, child care services being cut, housing subsidies being cut, student loans being cut. Um, this one in particular strikes me that, um, you know, uh, money for mental health, um, you know, was being cut. And, as, and especially um, money that allowed, um, you know, mental health people, uh, Money for uh, treatment of uh, mental health within like residential facilities or within hospitals. Essentially, what happened is a lot of um, of these residential facilities and these hospitals cleared out. And so I was in D.C. when Reagan was in office, and I remember just having um, a a very tangible kind of evidence of the impact because the amount of homeless on the streets increased like by tenfold. I used to walk to school. And I just remember all of a sudden seeing more and more and more homeless people. They eventually had, um, on D.C., there's a lot of marches. So, you know, there's the Women's March, there's the Civil Rights March, there's the Million Man March, there's the, you know, Moms Against Handgun Violence March. There's all these marches. And there was a homeless march. There was a rally for, um, you know, aid to homeless people. And what happened is uh, a lot of uh, homeless people, to, to get behind this, kind of walked uh, across the United States to get to D.C. And when they got there, it was like, hey, it's warmer here, usually. Um, and why would I walk all the way back? If I'm homeless, I can be homeless here versus there. 
And so they stayed. And I literally remember kind of walking to school, stepping around, and, and there were groups that I knew. Um, you know, some had a routine of kind of dancing around you and singing uh, as they asked for money. And I would dance and sing with them and try to, you know, do something nice for them, whether it was a, often a sandwich rather than money or whatever. But I, I had my, my groups that I knew uh, as I went to school. So that's, um, that one really stands out to me. Uh, food stamps, um, child nutrition and school lunch programs were cut. Um, they, I'll come back, literally to kind of save money, uh, on school lunches, they declared ketchup a vegetable. You know, because when they serve you your food, they're, you're supposed to kind of follow the, the, the food guidelines and give you that balanced meal. Uh, and you're only going to throw your vegetables out anyways. Let's be honest, right? You kind of, you know, poke around and, you, you know, they're, they're awful kind of frozen vegetables and you don't eat them. So they declared ketchup as a vegetable um, as a way to save money. And then the other thing we talked, uh, they talked about was uh, doing away with the Department of Education. Now, initially, again... Um, that's like, what? Uh, are you not for education? But their idea, their philosophy was, why is the federal government spending billions of dollars to manage education when the states could do it? Um, they looked at it as more of a reserved power. Okay? Um, ketchup is a vegetable. You'll remember that one. Um, in terms of the impact, again, like I said, it's, these are real hurts you put on people, but what are the long-range benefits? Because what you see is that if the federal government is spending less money, that is going to trickle down, but it's trickling down in terms of less money for state and local budgets. So that 5% cut represents a 25% cut in state budgets. Um, and then eventually uh, it, it's, uh, you know, we're, we're down to federal aid making up 17% um, of the state budgets. 22%, um, that 5% cut represents 22%. Uh, where we go from, excuse me, 22% to like 6%. Um, so, you know, that 5% cut causes a drop from 25 to 17 and 22 to 6. And at the same time, we're battling the Soviet Union. There is an, uh, the Soviet Union is our ideological opposite. They are communist. Um, they're, uh, you know, uh, in an anthema to capitalism, where it's about, you know, liberty within the uh, economy, the liberty to do as, as well as you can, and also the liberty to fail. Um, and you can get fabulously wealthy here. Here in the Soviet Union, it's, um, it's not only an oligarchy, which is contrary to democracy. Um, you've got this communist party that denies democratic rights, but they redistribute wealth. Um, and it, we look at it as a failing system, and probably rightly so. Um, you know, this, uh, at least in the, in the Soviet version of it. Um, you know, if you look at Sweden and Denmark and, and other uh, countries, they, they have a high ratio of taxes and happiness. Um, it's, it's uh, in our country to a certain, you know, when people worry about Obama being socialist, we've been socialists for a long time. We redistribute wealth. Um, you know, we do it in all kinds of ways. The second that Social Security and Medicaid and Medicare came out, that's redistributing wealth. When you give tax cuts to corporations, that's redistributing wealth. We do that. Okay? It's, the, it's an argument of to what degree. But at any point, at this point, um, it's kind of a frenzied, foaming at the mouth uh, Fear. The Soviet Union definitely expands. They've got the Iron Curtain that they've expanded into Eastern Europe. Uh, Cuba is communist. Vietnam is communist. There's a fear of the domino effect that when one country, if Mexico goes communist, we're next. And so we are just constantly at um, odds with the Soviet Union in a Cold War. The idea is uh, we don't want to fire a shot because, man, would that be a war. Uh, but we're going to find ways to fight by proxy ways to kind of wage economic warfare, uh, propaganda kind of warfare, uh, but most uh, frighteningly through the buildup of nuclear missiles. Um, you know, your fear when you guys were growing, or when, as you're growing up, is terrorism. Mine was nuclear annihilation. I don't know who's got it worse. Um, yours feels more random and, uh, you know, uh, could happen at any point. Got to be. Mine was just like game over. Um, and that's what we, all our movies were about. Like someone was going to hit the button and that's it. Um, so the idea with the nuclear buildup literally was what's called mutually assured destruction, MAD. Um, it's basically like you've got a gun pointed at my head, and I'm only safe, and we're only safe if I have a gun pointed at your head. Because we both have guns pointed at each other's heads, no one's going to pull the trigger, right? That's the idea. If you have 500 missiles pointed at me, I need 500 missiles. Well, what Reagan starts to do, and it actually kind of, you know, ends up being fairly successful, is he spends the Soviet Union into the ground. He begins to deficit spend 
to not only build up our missile programs, but to build up something called Star Wars, um, a strategic defense initiative, to essentially fund the research for, we're, we're not even kind of there yet, but to fund the research for putting satellites up in the sky that uh, use a series of mirrors and lasers, you're gonna love lasers, um, to shoot intercontinental ballistic missiles out of the sky. Okay, um, look something like this. And, uh, you know, it is uh, fanciful. Um, it is maybe bordering on the, you've got to be dead. This is uh, my, my uh, I'm worried about nuclear annihilation and I'm, I'm relying on a satellite with a pinpoint laser keeping me safe. You know, this was something people were skeptical about. But when you're spending on the United States side, the Soviet Union has to kind of keep pace, right? Um, I think I had the costs in here, didn't I? You know, look at the, we're spending $303 billion per year on defense. That's $34 million an hour. This is in 1980s dollars, by the way. $500,000, half a million dollars per minute on defense. This was a good time to be a defense contractor um, and work for defense industries. People were making money uh, in the defense industries. And what it did is it worked. It, it basically forced the Soviet Union to keep pace, which they couldn't because they're a communist country. Um, this is Mikhail Gorbachev. He has kind of a famous birthmark that makes him stand out. And he began a policy known as Glasnost, which was this idea of kind of um, um, beginning to reform communism to adopt some capitalist principles and begin to reach out to um, the West. And Reagan, um, you know, with his movie background, which really he played well to the camera, has one of the most famous speeches uh, or there's some iconic lines in here, where um, he challenges Gorbachev to go even further. And this is, this is, you know, in part why he will become this hero to the right as well. In the 1950s, Khrushchev... He's at the Berlin Wall. I didn't set that up well. But in the West today, we see a free world that has achieved a level of prosperity and well-being unprecedented in all of human history. In the communist world, we see failure. There is one sign the Soviets can make that would be unmistakable, that would advance dramatically the cause of freedom and peace. General Secretary Gorbachev, if you seek peace, if you seek prosperity for the Soviet Union and Eastern Europe, if you seek liberalization, Come here to this gate. Mr. Gorbachev, open this gate. That second line is the one that is the most often repeated, that Mr. Gorbachev tear down this wall. I think the camera pans out and the um, applause kind of, you know, between open this gate and tear down this wall, it takes away some of the dramatic impact. But, you know, that's the beauty of sound bites and, and editing. What most people kind of replay is that Mr. Gorbachev tear down this wall, delivered by Reagan, who again was a radio and, and TV and, and movie personality. He just delivers those lines so well. I didn't set it up well. You know the Berlin Wall, right? After the, um, uh, you know, World War II where we divide, uh, Germany becomes divided and part of it becomes communist and uh, part of it becomes, uh, stays democratic and they put a wall literally dividing them. And these pictures were electric. Um, you know, people never thought in their lifetime they would see that wall come down, okay? So, um, you know, what we've got is an interesting combination. Um, you've got... Um, all this defense spending that you contrasted to, like I've got tax cuts as well. The federal government is not bringing in as much money. Um, and did the uh, stimulated economy kind of supplement it? Well, no. Reagan essentially triples the debt. Triples. Um, and when I say triple, that $1 trillion debt was the sum total of the governmental debt dating back 190 years. 
So in eight years, we essentially tripled what took us 190 years to kind of build. Now, again, I, I'm trying to remind you that deficit and debt are different. Do you remember what a deficit is? What's a deficit? When you're spending more than you, when you're spending more than you take in, and it's the difference, right? But that difference doesn't get erased when you go into the next fiscal year. That difference is year to year to year. So you take your shortcoming from one year, and you have to add it to your shortcoming to this year. And currently, we're at a debt of around 19, yeah. bless you, 19 trillion. Um, this, you know, normally I, I put it in PowerPoint. That was my little uh, screen cap I did a second ago. Normally moves, right? I've shown you this, and it's scary because it moves. That 19 trillion is jumping. Um, how come? Why is the 19 trillion jumping? Why isn't it just staying constant? What do you got? In order to like spend more than we take in, we have to borrow, mostly from China and other countries. But uh, you know, China is one of the big financiers of the debt. And, and that's what we, we owe them interest on. So if we borrow from somebody, we owe them interest. If we borrow from other sources, we owe interest. So what you see um, is, where is it? Where's my interest column? See debt per citizen. There's an interest column here somewhere. I'll jump to my PowerPoint. I'm snow blind looking at that. You know, what you see in, in Reagan's time is essentially um, 69 billion uh, was what we were paying on the debt initially. It jumps to 169 billion. Uh, that's 14% of our budget. 14% of our budget was being spent on just financing the debt. Today it's around 6%. I think. I'm going to have to look at that later. What we see is an effort to kind of like address this. And again, man, does history repeat itself. Um, I don't think, I started to say, you know, you don't need to know about the Graham um, Rudman Hollings Act. Those are three um, congressmen that have their name attached to this act. Uh, it was pretty famous at its time. What I think you need to hold on to is the principle, because we just saw it recently with this sequestration that kicked in. We did essentially a similar deal where um, we set some budget deficit goals. We want to bring down the debt because we're really getting concerned about it. And uh, we'll exempt certain programs like Social Security or other entitlement programs like Medicaid. But if we don't hit our targets, if Congress can't get the job done, we're going to do these automatic across-the-board cuts. The, uh, the problem with Graham, uh, Graham Rudman Hauling was that it's kind of like, I don't know if you've ever set your own kind of targets. I'm going to get up early and exercise, and I'm, going to, um, I'm, I'm not going to have sugar at night. Um, I'm going to go to bed earlier. And you've imposed all these kind of limits on yourself. So what does it become easy to do? Yeah, you set it, you can move them. Uh, I'm going to, I'm going to, first thing I'm going to do when I get home today is do my study guide. I wonder if there's any cat videos on the internet uh, as you get home, right? So, and there are, there's a lot of cat videos on the internet. Um, so you set the limits, you can move them. They just kept kicking the can down the road. With the most recent cuts though, they did it. They, they kind of uh, went ahead and, and went through with sequestration. Um, so, you know, if you're talking, you might get a question about why is it so hard to achieve budget reform? One, because so much of our spending is mandatory. It's, uh, you know, the, the spending that we have to do by law. Two, when you cut from the discretionary spending, it hurts. Um, and you may not get kind of the benefit from it. Three, a lot of our money is tied up in interest to the debt. So that's another kind of mandatory spending. And then, and then four, what I'm introducing is, you know, the group that has to kind of uh, reduce the spending is, can just kind of move their restrictions. Um, it's why it's so hard for anybody to kind of self-discipline themselves. It's easier to kick that can down the road. So uh, the other thing you might get is kind of graphics occasionally that um, you have to kind of interpret. And what you'd see here is, um, you know, use your cues that green is revenue and, and red is spending. And with Reagan, you see, uh, you know, they'd ask you what a trend is, and that's more than one data point. Um, and what you'd see is... Um, you know, we were fairly consistent, but in the Reagan years, the spending really did jump up relative to the money. Uh, Clinton, we actually had a budget surplus. And then 9-11 and the war in Iraq and Afghanistan and the recession um, causes us to skyrocket again. And what people debate is, you know, is it high because of 
um, events, not necessarily Bush, but events that transpired um, with the wars, with the recession, or is it Obama's fault? And it just depends on what argument you want to make. Because again, we're fairly polarized. Um, Reagan is either, just like FDR, FDR is an icon, and either people love him because he created the modern welfare state, or they hate him because he created the modern welfare state. The Reagan revolution, everybody loves to cite Reagan like they do Jefferson, and they take the parts they like from him. Um, the assassination alone makes him iconic. Um, he, you know, uh, the fact that he survived, the fact that he looked um, uh, so kind of brave through it, he quips with the uh, surgeons, I hope you're all registered Republicans. Um, he tells his wife kind of sweetly, Nancy, I forgot to duck. How do you not like a guy that kind of comes out of assassination attempt with that kind of uh, resilience, right? Um, but for some people, he's the boogeyman um, because, again, he did all these cuts um, and it has, you know, real consequences. Tomorrow, we're going to go to, I'm kind of on this good pace. I'm where I need to be because we're doing kind of a, a type of federalism per day and then I'll do kind of a, a wrap up. But we're going to go to the de-evolution revolution. And this is where Congress, essentially, we're going to have a Republican sweep. It's Clinton, but Congress comes sweeping into, uh, Republicans, Republicans come sweeping into Congress and they try to take over uh, returning power to the states and therefore I have a cake fail, um, kind of a dump cake, um, because it, it, it doesn't work particularly. It's, it's like, okay, I'm handing it to Congress. They're, it's like handing off to your kid, uh, you know, make the birthday cake. It's going to be a little messy, right? President can kind of handle it. Congress is a little, you know, ham-handed. All right, so we'll actually pause there rather than chase you out of the room.